right, try again. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Leandro, and I'll be talking today about implementing network protocols in, in the Zephyr project. So um, before I begin, a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing open source work since 1999. I, did, I do have a few personal projects you might have heard of, so, such as Hard Info and uh, L1, uh, which is a web server. Um, and I've been a full-time engineer since 2010. Since then, I've worked on many different projects, including Enlightenment, WebKit, uh, Android, and a few others. Uh, I've recently joined the Zephyr project just last year, and uh, I did some work on the TCP stack. And um, this, this talk was, was going to be given by a coworker, which unfortunately couldn't be here today. So, uh, yeah, um, so yeah. So, also a little bit about Zephyr. Uh, as you might have, uh, as you might know, it's a microcontroller operating system with very small footprint. It works with for only 8K. Uh, it's open source under a Apache 2 license and hosted by Linux Foundation and supports multiple, multiple architectures. Uh, we have some demos and uh, a few booths uh, on, on, uh, upstairs if you'd like to check it out. Um, so uh, what I'm going to present today is uh, basically this. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the new AP stack and Zephyr. Uh, talk uh, a little bit about uh, the currently implemented network protocols, so application protocols, and some of the patterns that are used in these protocols. Um, please bear in mind that this is not an, an advanced talk, it's more like a, a beginner to intermediate talk, uh, so I will not dive deep into details. But of course, uh, you can ask uh, more, more complicated questions uh, at, at the end, and I'll be happy to take, happy to take them. So, uh, as you might, might know, Zephyr uh, has a new IP stack. So, until recently, it used a uh, micro IP from Contiki, uh, but it had some problems, uh, such as uh, not supporting uh, simultaneous IPv6 and IPv4, and uh, supporting only one network interface. Th those two things alone were a deal breaker, and uh, uh, um, the, the, one of the reasons that that made us actually write a new one from the scratch. Um, and moreover, it was uh, ported to Zephyr in a way that didn't fit well with the system. So uh, some parts of Contiki had to be ported over, and uh, some of the changes that has been made made it sort of, uh, unstable and sort of unfixable. So we decided to rewrite it from the scratch. And uh, now we support multiple interfaces, simultaneous IPv6 and IPv4. Uh, it fits very well with the, the rest of the system, and uh, including the buffer management, which is very important. And it's available since uh, 1.6. And 1.7, which is going to be released uh, tomorrow, uh, will enable TCP as well. So about multiple interfaces. So you can, uh, uh, as with many other things in Zephyr, you can uh, configure that at compile time. So you use kconfig and select everything you need. Uh, and can use, of course, Ethernet, Bluetooth, uh, Zigbee, Zlip for testing, and soon we'll have also Wi-Fi. And of course, you can mix, mix and match all the interface types. Um, and of course, you can have uh, simultaneous IPv6 and IPv4. Um, on this table, you, you, you can see um, that uh, enabling, uh, basically if you enable IPv6, there is not much need to not enable IPv4, it's just uh, 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 one kilobyte or about that uh, of code that's that, that in, in, in the text section. So it's, it's still very tiny. Um, but even then, we are talking about uh, near microcontrollers that has like a megabyte of flash or uh, lots of flash memory. So it's not much overhead to enable both at the same time. Um, another uh, characteristic of Zephyr is that it is heapless, so you don't have any malloc or free or anything that is similar inside it. But if we do, but if we need to at runtime uh, allocating the allocated memory, so we have some memory pools. And as for network stack, uh, we have separate pools for transmitting, receiving, and data fragments. So, and of course, being in our TAS, we have like timeouts, so things things from the pool, so you can wait indefinitely or you can just wait for a few milliseconds. 
Um, so in order to facilitate the, the memory allocation, we have uh, fragment chains. So it has, instead of uh, allocating a single linear buffer that can fit everything in, 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 in uh, a single contiguous space, we allocate fragments of 128 bytes. And uh, they, they form a sort of uh, link at the list or a tree. That we can build it uh, actually however you want. Uh, and of course, can uh, add and remove things and, and whatnot. So this makes it actually easy to implement protocols where you have like data fragments and then headers. So uh, the user only provides you uh, uh, the data they want to send but then you have to add headers. So just prepend a fragment with the headers and maybe compact. So it really makes the implementation a whole lot easier. Compacting is pretty much like the fragmentation on disks, right? Just there are like three fragments. Uh, you're using like 50% of each one of them. So just copy 50% uh, of the second fragment to the first fragment, throw away the second fragment, get the next fragment. So you just you can re, uh, uh, reduce the amount of fragments that are in flight. Uh, for some cases, you can copy the to linear buffer uh, in cases where you have, like, uh, I will talk about this, of course, but the, there are protocols where you, you, you actually have, it's easier to parse things when you have a linear uh, buffer that is uh, uh, pretty, pretty uh, linear uh, and not, you have, don't have to traverse a uh, link of the list every single time and then you read a byte. So uh, the kernel implemented network protocols, right? So we implement a bunch of protocols. Some of them are related to IoT, which is the focus of Zephyr. Uh, some are sort of collateral, and some were implemented mostly as a proof of concept. Because um, it's always a good thing whenever implementing an EU API to implement a proof of concept to, to see if you're doing the API right or not. So uh, an important thing on the internet is the DNS. Uh, the implementation we have has been implemented for NIST Scratch. Uh, it supports only A and uh, for A queries. Uh, basically, if you get, give you the domain name, you can get the IP address back. A is for IPv4 and uh, for A is for IPv6. Uh, it can have uh, concurrent queries, and of course, the number of queries is uh, configurable. Uh, uh, we use memory pools for, for the 512 chunk by chunks uh, that, that we use. So we linearize, linearize the, the buffers, the fragment buffers, into uh, a large buffer to, to, to be able to parse it. DDNS 0 can go to 1024. Uh, UDP, uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, so as for this uh, uh, version of the RFC, they recommend up to 512. Well, it's 25-year-old RFC. Right. Well, it's not implemented. Um, yeah, and it is available as a part of the platform. This is uh, one of the patterns that I'll be talking about uh, yeah, later. Another thing is the HTTP. Uh, it is important. Uh, many, many APIs are available uh, through uh, HTTP endpoints. Uh, we have a both client and server. You use the parser for Nginx and supports HTTP 1 and 1.1. But uh, it is only available as a sample application so because uh, there are a few reasons I'll be talking about later. Uh, there is NATS as well, also available as a sample application. NATS is a publisher and subscriber protocol. It's a very simple TCP-based protocol. Uh, you just subscribe to data, and, and whenever it's updated, you, you, you are notified. It's a line-based protocol. It was also implemented from the scratch. There is MQTT, also implemented from the scratch, and available as part of the platform. And it's uh, also one of the asynchronous APIs we have. Uh, and uh, there is CoAP. Uh, this has been implemented uh, based on lessons, based on the Soleta project. I'm not sure if everyone here knows it. I believe last year uh, we had some talks about it. Um, so you can do resource observation and notifications. You support all of these methods. And it's also available as part of the platform. Uh, and we also have uh, IRC, which uh, is not really useful as an IoT protocol, but is uh, very easy to implement and was the first test case we had for long-living TCP connections. 
Uh, it is available, of course, as a simple application, and uh, there is a bot that can run on, on boards. You can turn LEDs on and off from IRC commands. It's pretty cool. Check it out. <laughs> so, yeah, so some of the patterns that these protocols uh, have uh, regarding their implementation. So, asynchronous API. So, uh, they often use it with request-less protocols where information can be received at any time. Uh, so, clients are not um, blocked while reading from the network. So some background, background work is being done for you and whenever you need to receive something, you will be notified via, via the callback functions, right? So we have some of those. Uh, we have the linearization of buffers. So we have like uh, structs that are larger than a fragment size of 120 bytes. We, uh, currently the only thing we have right now that does this is the DNS queries. Uh, uh, so uh, this, we don't use that because it's not optimal, right? Have to uh, have like memory pools for large buffers. They have to do unnecessary memory copies, and these might even go away in the future. But um, it is unnecessary. It's a necessary evil at the moment. Um, So uh, reusing versus re-implementing. As you've seen, we've re-implemented a few of the protocols. So there are many libraries out there that implement these actually very well, but they're actually made to run on top of Linux. So they might use dynamic memory allocation, and although you can have that on Zephyr, we try to avoid these things as much as possible. Um, they also assume a POSIX operating system. Uh, and although our network APIs, they, they sort of mimic the some of the behaviors of POSIX, um, the APIs are different, and we don't offer yet a facade of API to, uh, so, so that it can just uh, uh, plug in your code and it is gonna work. So you have, you have to have a small sham that does the, the, the conversion of APIs. And of course, it might have been written in C++, using like a standard type of library and things like that, which are not really suitable for systems that have a few single digits, uh, kilobytes of RAM. So, um, and of course, but there's always caveats. I mean, um, existing implementations may be very mature and may, be, uh, may, may work well and support a bunch of stuff, and including stuff you actually need to do your product with. And re-implementing is tricky, and we're, because of, uh, it's not going to be as mature as uh, limitations that have been uh, many years in the market. You're not leveraging all, all, all the, the, the possible years of development. On the other hand, we have lots of control uh, and can have a tighter in uh, integration with the rest of the system. And luckily, most of the protocols we have implemented are actually very simple protocols. So we, we didn't waste too much time uh, writing that, uh, those things. Um, mostly because we actually don't need all the features. I mean, we're just writing an RTOS, so for HTTP, for instance, we just sometimes need to, I don't know, uh, call, um, call an API endpoint that will give you your location or, 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 uh, or do something like that. Or um, for ARC, you just want to turn an LED on and off. Um, so we really don't need all the features in a protocol to, 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 to have it available in an RTOS. And there is uh, the simple applications versus the platform uh, APIs. So simple applications, there, we, we, we see them mostly as a task bed for APIs. So there are no um, API stability guarantees. Uh, and it's mostly uh, useful uh, as, a, as a demonstration purpose. Um, and of course, they're not part of the IoT suite of uh, uh, protocol. So for instance, um, IRC is not one of those things, uh, MQTT is. So, and uh, on the other hand, we have the uh, APIs that are available as part of the platform. So we have um, stable, more complete APIs uh, that are suitable for production use, and mostly protocols that are actually part of the IoT suite, again, quotes, because I didn't think there's such a thing. Um, so yeah, so 
Another thing is uh, we have uh, we have, sometimes have to have uh, some compromises. So uh, the NAS protocol it requires a JSON parser. So the, whenever you connect to it, it sends you a JSON message. So most JSON parsers will create uh, objects in memory of like give you a tree of the JSON object in memory, and uh, that's not only only slow and you don't really have much control of the memory allocate, time memory is going to take to allocate. Uh, so we wrote our own, which is zero copy, decodes directly to uh, struct. It is type safe, as in, again, quotes, uh, because it's only going to decode a value if it, uh, the type is correct, is expected for that, that particular value. And it is no temporary structs or anything. It decodes directly to struct that you need. Uh, of course, only necessary things are implemented. Uh, so. Right now, no nested objects or arrays, although I have an implementation for that, and then I just have to test it uh, more thoroughly. It is UTF-8 aware, but not strict, so if you feed it uh, invalid UTF-8, it's not gonna uh, bet an eye. But the, 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 the thing is, this is mostly used for machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications where you're gonna send tokens if they're only ASCII. So for your majority of use cases for the JSON parser, this is not gonna be a problem. Um, it doesn't support floating point numbers, uh, so if you have, uh, say, uh, well, it doesn't support that, and uh, JSON, is, with JavaScript, all numbers are, are floating points, so um, yeah, if you need that, you're not going to have with this. And, of course, uh, because of some limitations inside, you can only have up to 32 fields, which is actually, uh, I believe, a very good compromise. So. I'll show you an example and you'll understand this limitation in a minute. So, uh, speaking of implementations, here are some code samples. Uh, I cherry picked two only, as we don't have much time. And uh, this is not really an advanced talk, but I figured I should show some of these things anyway. So, uh, can anyone, everyone see that? That's very light. Well, so this is a, uh, how we define your co-app endpoints and how we define the, the, um, the, the things that are in gray, I'll show you better in the next slides, so you don't need to squint. Uh, so basically, the, uh, for instance, the, these things here, LED get, LED post, and put, are, uh, are going to be called whenever uh, these methods, so if you get a post or a put, are, are, are called on, on that particular endpoint. So the path is defined as a, an array of, 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 of uh, strings. So um, all, all the uh, path matching is done inside the co-op uh, library. So you don't have to worry about that as well. So pretty simple. Uh, it makes a lot of things a lot easier to, to work with. Um, so JSON parsing. So uh, this is just an overview of the code. I'll go through it so it's easier to, to understand. So you basically have uh, uh, my struct here has an integer and a string and uh, there is a field macro just to uh, help creating these uh, what are called descriptors. They basically just tell uh, and in the my struct there is a field number which is uh, a, a number and there is a field named string that is a string. Okay, so this is just for you to tell the parser that uh, Whenever you see that particular field in that object, it, it must be that value. If it is not, par the, the parsing fails. Um, and then you allocate space for your struct, and then tell the parser, hey, do your job, right? And it's going to uh, uh, lex parse it and do all the thing and decode it directly that struct. So no, uh, no memory copies, it just, for strings, it just puts a uh, terminating null and sets the pointer. It's, it's pretty simple, pretty nice. And of course, the, the limitation for the 32 uh, uh, fields is just this, because the return value is a bit, uh, it's a bit mask. So, so the first field, in that, that case number, it's gonna be uh, the least significant bit, significant bit. The second field is gonna be the string, because it's gonna be the second uh, least significant bit, significant bit. So if the two are set, both two fields were uh, decoded correctly. If they're not set, they're not decoded, they were not found in the object. So you can, you can use that field or not uh, 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 based on return value. So that's why you have only 32 values because it's a 32-bit integer return value. Um, 
So, so yeah, wrapping up. So we saw some of the differences between the old and new IP stack. Um, uh, we've seen also seen some of the protocols currently implemented, uh, some of the patterns used by the implementations, and all, we also saw some, some code samples, right? Um, so I'd like to make some questions. So um, what would you do differently? Uh, what protocols are you going to help uh, us and implement on Zephyr, right? So you know, with that, I open for questions or answers. Uh, Uh, so the question, okay. So the question was if I, I plan to implement uh, real-time protocols um, such as uh, uh, Modbus and, and other similar. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, any any development on that. I haven't seen any, any 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 talk about implementing these these protocols yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't yet have Wi-Fi. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have to repeat a question. So, um, so the question was: uh, Do we still do we already support Wi-Fi on Zephyr? Uh, and uh, the answer is not yet. It's planned, of course, but uh, we don't yet support Wi-Fi. Is that something later in the year? I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't really know, unfortunately. I, uh, so the question is, if I understood correctly, uh, uh, what are the protocols that are going to be implemented to support Wi-Fi? Is that? When, are you going to use existing pro uh, projects and Wi-Fi stacks or, or uh, If I'm going to use, well, I, 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 I didn't have the answer for that. I, 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 I haven't worked on, on, on drivers or uh, implementing the connectivity part of the, the stack. So I, I really don't have the answer for that. But you can send me an email. I can follow up with these, these questions later. I can figure out. Is there uh, known hardware, Wi-Fi hardware, which is going to be part of OK, so uh, these are so about hardware support. So uh, we support a few boards. Some of these boards already have Wi-Fi connectivity. Some of them do not have. Uh, but of course, there are add-on modules that might be supported in the future. It depends on people actually writing the drivers for them. Um, that really depends on a bunch of things. So, uh, question there? You mentioned that you uh, wrote your own JSON parser. Yes. Uh, Did I consider Jasmine uh, instead of just using a JSON parser? Actually, uh, this parser has been written in uh, like a day. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was very quick, really quick to, uh, quickly to write it. And so I, I didn't even bother uh, checking out all their parsers because uh, I wanted to have something that was really, really small. I mean, it's like 500, 400 lines of code. So it fits well in, within the, all, all the limitations we have in Zephyr. Question there? Um, so I'm also interested in the real-time with Right, right. So how do we, how do we um, how do we create this is this is self-organizing with Google? Um, how do you how do uh, companies like Google recommend like if you want to um uh so basically what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to develop by myself, but by starting a contribution, how how can we organize ourselves into other like subgroups or other groups and different protocols? Well, we, um, so the question is, how, how do we work with uh, the project to implement our own protocol? Is that correct? correct. Okay. So uh, on, on the Zephyr web page, we have uh, described very, uh, very clearly how, how our process works. So it's very easy, just the, the, the wiki and the pages with documentation for that. But in a nutshell, it's um, 
actually very simple. All the devel development is in making, made in the open, have open issue trackers and, and, and code repositories. All the reviews are made in, in the open. We have our C channels, yeah, so mailing lists. Can even propose things on mailing lists, for instance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's pretty simple. Do you have any other questions? Here. It's okay. Yeah, so wired networking, uh, what about it? So yeah, so we have uh, support, uh, actually, uh, yes. here. So we support multiple interfaces, and so Ethernet, on boards that support it, Bluetooth, uh, low energy, and uh, Sleep for testing. We use Sleep mostly with KMU, for instance, which is, which is very handy. And uh, I can mix and hash and do these things. Have another question? Down the back. So I keep hearing small footprint noises, but I've never heard anyone actually say how big you know, something is. So you gave an example of an IRC thing to toggle an LC. Right. What platform are you on and how much memory did it actually take to do that? Okay. So these measurements here, it's not the IRC. Okay, so you're talking about small footprint and and um, the, um Wondering how, how how big the, the, the code is actually for these kind of things. So I didn't have uh, this is not my computer here, so I can't really just show you uh, uh, a measurement. But uh, this is a similar application. This is an Echo server. This one has been built with both UDP and uh, TCP support. So for x86 32-bit, uh, so you can see that uh, this is the text uh, section of all the code. So all Zephyr. So uh, thread scheduling, drivers, everything uh, fits in 12 kilobytes of code with both IPv6 and IPv4 enabled. And that's x86? x86, yes. And what's, what's, how about the RAM? The RAM, I don't have the figures here, and I don't really remember that. But it, the thing is, it's very configurable. So you can say, OK, my application is going to make only one connection at a time. So you can just say, OK, well, only one context will be uh, used. So you can really have things very dumb. It, it runs with single digits uh, 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 kilobytes, so nine kilobytes, sometimes even less, sometimes a little bit more. But with that working, I'd say you'd, you'd need a few double digits, kilobytes of RAM. All right, there's another question here. Hmm. Okay, so uh, the question was about uh, test suites, you know, uh, how much uh, time it takes to do many, many different tasks. Yes. So um, there is a test suite, uh, and then we actually run that every single time someone sends a patch. But I'm not sure if you have benchmarks such as, I don't, I don't remember. Hmm. I don't think we have that. Uh, uh, I can check it out. Of course, can always shoot me an email. I can check it out and follow up. Any question there? So I am not knowing anything about Zephyr. Okay. Uh, in detail, uh, I'm assuming that this is kind of like a uh, inclusion uh, on configuration for code section, and we don't have dead code playing. Okay, so the question was, uh, is code is not being used, uh, eliminated during compilation, uh, compilation phase? Well, yes. Uh, uh, however, uh, there are some cases where, for instance, we have like structs with information, and in the application, you might not need that. So you can just say in the configuration, you don't need these features, so the structs will be smaller because certain fields are not being included in the code. Uh, 
So uh, you can't really do these kinds of things automatically, but so that's why there are configuration for these. Um, and of course, if um, um, functions are not used uh, during compilation fa phase, actually the linking phase, they're just thrown away, so the code ends up being smaller anyway. Mm -hmm. Any other question on the back? Okay, so uh, a bit about IPv6 versus uh, uh, 6 low pen. We do have 6 low pen, it is supported, uh, uh, but this code uh, doesn't use it, so it's not uh, included here. Have another question here? So the uh, buffer linearization right. API, mm -hmm. so is it like really exist in the core? Because uh, I recently had to re-implement it once again. Oh, yeah. So, I could, but it's not my computer, so I, I really don't have the source code here. Uh, so yes, about to have to repeat the question. Sorry. Uh, so about the buffer linearization API, uh, does, is it part of core? Yes, it is part of the core. It's part of the net and buff API. There is a what is called net and buff L copy or something like that. Okay, but right. I probably did it right because it may go uh, all the way. And this is pretty worrying, and that's something I would like to share with the core web of the Okay. Please remember that you have users outside. Uh, yes, is that, okay, that, that's true. Uh, so APIs are, uh, that we release are, are, are going to stay there until they are deprecated. Uh, um, so, um, this API, as far as I know, is not going to be deprecated anytime soon, but it may go away if uh, nobody uses that. And if we, we are going to deprecate any API, uh, this is going to be uh, notified. Uh, in, in, uh, we have a cadence of deprecating API, so when we release a case, this is going to be deprecated, next release is going to, not going to be there and whatnot. Okay. Well. That, that's fair. That's fair. Yes, that is fair. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do about that. Uh, I can't prom promise anything. No. All right, another question there? Um, this is not Linux. This is yes. Right. Hmm. Okay, so about how, how to uh, look forward to, to uh, uh, API compatibility and things like that. Okay. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I, I'll answer that with an example. So, for Zephyr 1.6, we did a major restructuring of our kernel. So, we had a few uh, different modes of operation. We had like nano kernel, uh, micro kernels, and a few other things. So, we unified, we have now what we call the unified kernel. But uh, this meant that um, some of the APIs uh, that were available for users had to go away. But we could, couldn't just do that, a new version. Hey, everything you did is going to 
be thrown in the garbage. You can't really do that with our users. So what we do have is a um, compatibility layer, which is very, very thin. It's almost in, uh, invisible, almost uh, uh, no cost, uh, that converts all the APIs to the new APIs. So, um, so we think about uh, compatibility. Uh, this is important. So, um, and but when 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 you, uh, and, but we do also provide uh, deprecation uh, deprecation strategy. So in one version it's deprecated, in the next we may it may go away. Uh, so people are actually notified when these things are going to happen, uh, so they can prepare themselves. Uh, and um, and when we provide uh, the, uh, the these compatibility layers, uh, we try to do that as uh, the least amount of. Yeah, but sometimes it doesn't even use a byte more. Sometimes it's just a macro that adapts one function call to another function call. Sometimes there's this static uh, inline function that's going to be inlined by compiler anyway. It's not going to make any difference in the end. Yeah, so. Yes. Thanks. Question in the back? Yeah, so I have a question that's uh, not necessarily specific to, to networking so much as uh, sort of the configuring of, of the network. Um, so in this case, you have a high-level SO server application, and you're able to bring in IPv4 or IPv6 yes. as modules to retain compatibility at the application level. Um, but what about, uh, is there a notion of subsetting the IPv6 set for smaller platforms versus having a uh, bigger stack Not all platforms would have strong IPv 
like uh, bits of work or especially like encrypting their viewers and playing platforms mm -hmm. that differently or, or whatnot? Here's how, how you guys Okay, so the question was uh, about uh, how fine-grained our configuration is. So uh, we have like a big future, like PV6 can have like smaller versions of it. You just pick the things you're really going to need. Well, they really, uh, in a general sense, that really depends on, on the features. Some of them you, you, you set uh, using uh, the, the kconfig tool. Uh, some of these are not as fine-grained. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the feature. Right now, for at least for IPv6, it's not really fine grained. I, I I would have to to, to check on that, but I, I do believe we have like things like header compression is optional, and a few other things are optional. But I'm not really uh, sure about that. I'd have to check it out. I do, unfortunately, I don't have my, my my code here, so I can't really show uh, on the screen. But I can follow up. It's it's easy. Just shoot me an email. The there's the address. Any question there? Uh, what about uh, BSD socket compatibility API? Okay, so what about BSD socket compatibility API? Yes, that's something we really want. Uh, so although the, the, our APIs are different, for instance, all networking uh, send and receive calls are actually asynchronous. You can send, like, tell uh, uh, timeouts and a few other things. Um, but in generally, most of the... Um, Semantics are uh, very, very uh, similar to what we have in, in, in the BSD sockets API. So creating a shim that converts from our API to BSD sockets is not much work. Uh, so, so for 1.7, unfortunately, no, because uh, in the future, yes, and I believe actually in the in the near in near future, that's something we want to do. Is there any other question in the back? Yeah, I have a question in terms of uh, like long term support with respect to uh, SOC vendors. So, like the Linux kernel, um, there's mainline, and then the uh, SOC vendors will also release the, uh, their kind of current uh, stable release uh, as a sub subset branch. Um, so, if you have Alpine Mix 6, there's a, uh, an SOC release of the kernel that's the scale in behind. Uh, Um, so the question was more about uh, how SEC vendors will um, keep uh, up to date with uh, the Zephyr development. So, well, I really don't have an answer for that. But, but from what I've been seeing, uh, all development is, being, is made on, on, on the, the uh, mainline branch. I mean, things are sometimes in, in, in its own branch, but then it's merged back to the master branch. So. When you pull the code, all the support code for, is, is there. Of course, that doesn't mean uh, a SSC vendor A or B uh, can't I mean have their own uh, their own tree and things like that. Yeah. And there was also talk yesterday by Andy Gross on the device tree support. Right. So it's similar to what we have in Linux, but it's going to be. Will that specifically sort of apply that connect? Because with so much configuration in that blue layer, and in that vendors, it forces you to stay on a stable thing for commercialization. And that's the question of whether the blue layer allows future Zephyr code bases and sort of mainline to stay in current.
have another question? OK, so I believe we're done. But if you have another questions that I want to ask here, just send them an email. I'll be happy to have to reply. Thanks. <laughs>